Okay. All right. Say whatever you want, Ellie. And when those 25 million people get arrested, what do you think happens to their families, especially if they're the breadwinner? Oh, gee, that's another little bill you encounter as a taxpayer, huh? You don't think it affects you. You don't care if marijuana is legal or not. Well, you're paying the bill for the stupidity, okay? So I think you better start caring. How many homes are destructed completely because people went to jail and, and, and somehow the family structure was unable to hold it together because you have been misinforming people for six generations. And when you have five generations of lies and misinformation, you have no way of making rational decisions as a nation or as individuals. Now, we're very lucky. This is the sixth generation. And you, I keep saying this, and it's because this prohibition really took hold when California, back in 1913, the same year the Fed started, um, and the drug laws began to be signed. But, you know, Randall Hurst was already coming out there with lies about this horrible new drug, this plant. If there was such a plant, of course it would have to be prohibited. I mean, it did horrible things. It made you murderers, it made you jump off buildings, it made you rapists. It, of course it had to be prohibited. But they forgot to tell you there was no such plan, and what they were really outlawing was hemp, cannabis. Cannabis has been here from the beginning of time as the most precious gift the Creator has bestowed upon this planet. Back to the environment, yeah, the paper, the cotton mills. I want to be wearing hemp all the time. Hemp blends. The cotton mills are okay. Uh, you're saying that's natural too. Yeah, but not the pesticides and herbicides that it takes to grow that cotton. That's, there's nothing natural about that. So forget about that too. Uh, so Constitution extends to no families, and we are the largest minority in the country and in the world. I have never been anywhere, and I've been to every state in the United States, to Canada, to Finland, to Norway, to all of Scandinavia, uh, kind of avoided Sweden most of the time. Uh, and then, it's, that's a kind of a private joke among people because they're really strict. But they're like, they, they listen to Gabriel Nahas, so our American advisor back in the 80s, you know, the, the happy guy that enforced all these laws that Nixon put in effect for us. <laughs> but anyway, the, Scandinavia, uh, and then we went to the Netherlands, and uh, of course everyone else is awakening. And it thrilled me because the first time I went to Norway in 1997, by the way, I got there with my frequent flyer miles for flying to all these other states with the groups of people who were kind enough to take me with them and teach me what I was learning from them. Young people between 18 and 25, there were a national group called the, the uh, Cannabis Action Network. Beautiful young people. I learned from those people more than I ever will from the rest of us all put together <laughs> because they were young and educated and, and, you know, and they wanted to do things. And, uh, yeah. So, const yeah. so yeah, no, the constitution. Tell me, a, tell me a little bit more about um, how the hemp can save the environment and the planet. I really like how you talk about that stuff. Well, you want to go back to the paper thing? Yes. Oh. Oh, okay, well, the papers, one thing is we definitely need to stop the deforestation through papers. I really get upset every day when I look in my mailbox with a bunch of garbage I can't even read with the site that's left to me thanks to the prohibition. And, and it's all dead trees. For what? I don't know. Those papers, even if you save them in a safe, uh, will still continue to deteriorate because of the chlorine and acid that's used to break down the lignin from those old trees. You, don't, you can do that with peroxide, which is a much kinder solution with the cannabis plant, the hemp plant. But the, ha the hemp plant also um, can be harvested every year, and in some places even twice a year, sometimes even three times a year, but definitely once a year. It's a big change, and you reoxygenate the planet, and that's why Jack here always said hemp can save the planet. And that's just one of the things. As I said, the cotton's another one. You've got to get rid of the herbicides and pesticides. You've you got to get rid of all that for your food. One in every two, every other one of us is supposed to have a form of cancer. That's an epidemic. And if you don't realize it's a huge problem by looking at that, then I don't know what it's going to take for us to wake up. 
My petition to the people running from dog catcher to president is still is, what are you want to do about the environment and the hemp prohibition? Oh, by the way, hemp, the thing that they wanted to, that they started prohibiting in 1913, right here in California, uh, was also in, 19, in 1619 in the colonies, Jamestown, Virginia. The, some of the first laws came out that you had to take a part, a parcel of your land and grow hemp. That's how you paid your taxes because at that time, hemp was still 80% of the world's commerce. All the oil, all the sales, the constitution that brought your forefathers into this country carried 165 tons of hemp. The oakum that held it together so the water wouldn't get in there and destroy the boat, that's all hemp. The, 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 the cotton and nylon sales they make today, that would have never made it through the time that they came uh, in hurricane season. You're talking April, I mean, you're talking September, August, September, October. That's hurricane season if you live in the Atlantic. I lived in Florida most of my life, so I really know that one. So, so those, those boats were full of hemp, and those are your forefathers. Your first laws were about hemp. And to lie about it and call it something else, you know, it's a little disingenuous to say the, the least. But the fact that we have a prison industry and a health industry that are running all our country, which will not allow us to have one dime for anybody's future. I don't care if you smoke pot or not, you're gonna be paying through your nose for everyone else to go to jail, for their families to have social promise to programs to be supported. People like me who listened to that lady with the powdered nose in the 80s who told us to just say no. She was doing her recreation. I needed my medication, but I didn't want to pee in a jar in front of a stranger or go to the wrong address to live at. So I just didn't work, which makes me really happy. I always wanted to be just your tax burden. That's just what we all wanted to do. And you did it to me and you did it to millions and millions and millions of others because you arrested 25 million of us. And you bet too many of, of us were Seriously, our patients, friends, relatives, and physicians who cared. And I know I've been to their trials. I just came back from here reuniting from one of them who did five years for caring too much. Yeah, and so at no level is this prohibition acceptable. Judge Francis L. Young, who was the, the administrative law judge for the DEA, 1988 was a terrific year. That's the year I was acquitted in Florida, and we established a medical defense for that state, but they still don't have medical marijuana on the books. Now I hear they have a semblance of hemp with no THC allowed for some cases, but that's not what we need. <clears throat> anyway, um, what? Uh, we need to, this prohibition is, is uh, so Francis L. Young said that cannabis was safer than most of the peoples we consume daily. He said that the only danger from marijuana was if a bale fell on your head. He, he said that if you ate 10 raw potatoes, you would have a toxic reaction, re reaction that you would never get from pot. And he also went on to say that for a government to come between a patient's suffering and the benefits of this Benign substance was unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious, and as you know, I add to that unconstitutional and immoral. Immoral all the way. How many people in our own families and circle of friends we turn against each other? All of us who need each other turn against each other with this lies and misinformation. But you are the sixth generation, and you have the internet. Up to this point, the theme of my life, my roller coaster life, um, the ticket I bought in 75 when someone says you smoke or you go blind, that roller coaster ride brought me to all of you, and I'm extremely grateful for that and all the knowledge that we're sharing. And now, you need to make sure that it continues because in 1980, we almost had it. I wasn't even into it. I didn't even know any of this. I had been smoking marijuana since 75, but I didn't know all the laws and the crazy things that were going on. 
But Judge Young made it very clear it should be legal, and the DEA had several hearings after that and just said no. And that man died of cancer without ever using legal marijuana, and I think that's so tragic because he did more for us than anyone else. But of course, you didn't read his statements in your front page, Sacramento Bee, now did you? I didn't read it in the Miami Herald either. But that was 1988, and then at the same time, Jack Hare was coming out with the book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, which I was acquainted with two years later, and that's what really changed my life, because that's when I became aware that we were arresting 25, let's see, 2,500 to 300,000 people, 300,000 people a year. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I really do believe in karma and what goes around comes around. And the thought of what we would have to face as a nation, if this is what we're doing to our people, our patients out of greed, just to keep the farmer from computing with, from paper, clothing, construction materials, pharmaceuticals and food. In other words, everything you need to survive, we need to keep you, the farmer, out of it. Because <laughs> we're the industrial complex. That makes sense, right? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is that, is that something we need to continue? Is there ignorance, blindness? What's the name of the book I was supposed to be writing? But this, luckily, this last five years have really shown me that ignorance is totally optional, so I don't want any legislator in particular to tell me that they don't know what I'm talking about. If a blind woman who doesn't even know how to use a computer knows this much, and you're writing the laws I have to live under, don't you dare tell me you're ignorant, because if you are, it is your option. You can't use that as an excuse anymore. Anytime you watch a debate, you can see that to be true. I've been enjoying those since the 90s, since, since I got arrested in 88, I've been debating with the DEA, and my biggest accomplishment was on LA today, when the DEA turned down that recommendation I just talked to you about. By then, it was 1994, President's Day, around there. I ended up on LA today debating with uh, Judge, Judge, what's his name, Bonner, ex Robert Bonner, ex-head of DEA. And the public had to call in, and, you know, did I win? Did he win? I won. How much do you think the percentage was? Give, give me a guess what you think I won, percentage-wise. On, on the debate? Yeah. Uh, you know the answer. I told you. I think, well, didn't you tell me 80%? 90? Well, that's what you told me. 84%. It was 90. 90%. <laughs> 90. Uh, we were talking yesterday about her smoking this uh, DEA uh, agent on uh, a debate. <laughs> and uh, she pretty she pretty much told him. him how it was. I nailed him. That was so cool. <laughs> then he said, then he's so sneaky. What well, his last question I'll never forget because he comes and says, Well, you have to first you just wanna get high. You just wanna smoke legally, that's all, that's all blah blah blah. And then he says because and then he changes it by saying, you and Robert Randall cannot possibly know that it's marijuana that's maintaining your pressure. You do other drops and blah, blah, blah. And he went on about that. And I did that. And I says, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I'm in the United States, I do those other drops. But when I'm like, I, when I'm somewhere where it's legal, I don't need your drops. <laughs> that was the end of the interview. <laughs> wow. So oh, that was, that was, I got such a kick out of that one. That was when I really enjoyed How do you feel about, um, so far, I think we have like 26 or 27 states with legal and medical yes. bills. How do you feel about, by the time this is all going to be finished with 50 laws for 50 states and 50 angles? Well, what, first of all, think? continue to change the laws in your states, of course. Continue to do everything you can to educate and make sure changes happen. But more important is make sure you contact your legislators, starting with your president, and make sure you remind him he has powers that can change this. And also your Congress and your legislators all the way around remind them that when a man-made law is contrary to the law of nature, it has no validity anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances, and remind them that that, that comes from uh, stones 
Blackstone commentaries, law commentaries. So every legislator that's there had to have read that because that was the basis. I'm sure it's not anymore because they really want you to know your constitution. And uh, that was the basis of our prudence jurisdiction from the law, from England law. So you got to know that law and this cannabis can, this is insanity to arrest an adult for choosing a wiser bud is the epitome of hypocrisy and total stupidity. But to arrest a person for choosing the creator's work, that can only be called blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. So let the true spirit of love shine through you. Learn all you can, pass it on, and don't let any legislator go to the false winning with your help, if they don't help you change this hideous loss, get a commitment from them on that and then go help them get in. We gotta make the changes. Yeah. <coughs> this is the time to do it. The time's now. I just yeah. stop this. Thank you so much, Alvi. <laughs> um, you're really um, a blessing and a um, really amazing person to hang out with. I really appreciate it. Well, it's people like, it's all of us. You know, that's the beauty of this whole movement. There is not one single person that deserves the credit for the change. There's not a one out there. I don't care who you think you are. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. happen, and I certainly am not. Yep. <laughs> you know, but what it has taken is hundreds of thousands of really dedicated people educating each other and not giving up no matter how ridiculous it has seemed and we, it has been a tough battle i traveled the country visited people who hosted us and, and you know got us the interviews television radios and uh, newspapers and all but when we left half of those people in south carolina north carolina georgia and all the states they were being hassled by law enforcement some of them ended up in jail you know, if they had any pot around for any reason, that was a good excuse. Can you imagine someone writing laws that allow people to take over your life because you do something as benign, that's the word, benign, as marijuana? And you, worse than that, can you imagine you putting up with it all these generations? I, I couldn't. Once I started learning this, I could never stay home again. I don't even own a home anymore. And I'm not sorry. I need to be wherever I am.